Studio. Hello, everyone. My name is Nora, and today I wanted to share with you the topic that my keystone explores. My keystone is titled as Optimizing Foundry Production Through Data Analysis Pipeline. In simpler words, I wanted to explore how data can affect the production of a firm, and more specifically, a production of a foundry. When I first started working towards Keystone, I was envisioning going more of a social studies route and exploring social service and seeing what kind of results can they show. However, I was also growing interest in the work of a foundry where my father works and where I worked a couple of seasons in data entry. This here in the picture is actually the foundry that I worked at. And this is also the foundry where I did my experiential learning when I decided that my keystone will go more of a manufacturing route. When I decided that, in fact, I want to explore the potential of using data in manufacturing firms, specifically a foundry, I was envisioning in the end a very automated production line where the input of workers is minimal. Just need to gather data and the rest is done. I was quite wrong. My problem was that when I thought of production, I thought of it this way. You get the order, you do some steps, the product is done and shipped. Very straightforward, very linear. In reality, this is how the production process looks at the foundry. It was definitely more complicated than I expected. I promise I will not go into explaining every stage of production process. I also promise to explain what the foundry is in a simpler way later on. But notice that the stages don't just go chronologically by step. They divide, interconnect, so it's pretty hard to keep track of. Moreover, you can check out how data is collected, entered, and exchanged in the foundry. Making this figure was a big wake-up call to me as to how data works in reality and that things are not as straightforward as I sometimes want them to be. Several softwares are used, they're not connected, and in some cases it causes the data to be entered several times. Next in the presentation, I want to present the processes in the foundry, specifically the ones related to the analysis. After, I want to introduce the workflow of the analysis pipeline that will focus specifically on analyzing the factor's influence on proportions of defects in the foundry. So, what is a foundry? In the video, we can see the furnace with metal and alloying elements. It heats up to the point that the metal will melt. Alloying elements are used to bring certain properties to the metal. Well, the metal is melt. Hello everyone, my name is Nora and today I wanted to share with you the topic that my keystone explores. My keystone is titled as Optimizing Foundry Production Through Data Analysis Pipeline. In simpler words, I wanted to explore how data can affect the production of a firm and more specifically a production of a foundry. When I first started working towards Keystone, I was envisioning going more of a social studies route and exploring social service and seeing what kind of results can they show. However, I was also growing interest in the work of a foundry where my father works and where I worked a couple of seasons in data entry. This here in the picture is actually the foundry that I worked at. And this is also, the foundry where I'm this way. So the processes in the foundry, specifically the ones related to the analysis. After, I want to introduce the workflow of the analysis pipeline that will focus specifically on analyzing the factor's influence on proportions of defects in the foundry. So, what is a foundry? In the video, we can see the furnace with metal and alloying elements. It heats up to the point that the metal will melt. Alloying elements are used to bring certain properties to the metal. Well, the metal is melt. Should we try to get, um. should we go to the next presentation and try to figure out if we can get another version of this? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with Nora. Okay, um, I do have her latest presentation. Okay. Yeah. So let's just. I should be Let's just start.
a little technical problem. <laughs> In case you haven't noticed yet and you're still sitting. Um, that's why I use a Mac and this is very complex, this is a Windows machine. Um, so we're going to the next presentation and then um, I will find Nora's full presentation which is uh, Sam Ralph, uh, which is uh, bridging like a, um, a, um, a, a psychosis. Hello everyone, welcome to my Keystone presentation. My name is Sam and today I will discuss the topic of psychosis, including what it is, symptoms, treatments, and how philosophy can be utilized to understand psychosis. But before that, I'd like to direct the attention to my question. My question is, what are the relationships between experiences and consciousness? This acted as my guiding question throughout my time at Quest. And going through several ideas, I decided to narrow in and explore the realm of psychosis. And in my paper, I dis discussed two main points which I'll address today in this presentation. The first one is the urge to find alternative treatments as the current ones are quite debilitative. The second one is how can we perceive psychosis through philosophy? Another reason that was also a driving force for why I picked this topic was my own experience of a psychosis. Going back to March 2019, I was admitted to St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, where I stayed at a psychiatric ward for about six weeks. Without getting into too much details, all I can say was that it was the lowest time in my life and was a very tough and discomforting environment. It then took a year to recover, taking heavy dosages of medications, and the question of if I have psychosis still lingers on to this very day. I feel this tends to be a topic that many who have undergone similar experiences wouldn't really share and push back due to it being a dark past. But this made it all the more of a challenge for me to relive that past, learn more about myself, and write, write an academic paper on it. So let's delve in with the presentation with what is psychosis. Psychosis is a neuropsychiatric illness caused by conditions of cognitive disorder. And so what happens is that there are effects in the brain and disruptions of brain processes and therefore conception of reality. And a psychosis can be triggered by various reasons, including genetic, substance-induced, or environmental stressors. The degree of severity, known as the psychosis continuum, distinguishes what course of action is needed to be taken and is indicated through the symptoms. When we look at symptoms, there are two categorizations. There's the positive and negative symptoms. The positive ones are what is added to our experiences, and this includes delusions, hallucinations, such as auditory ones, and paranoia, just to name a few. On the other hand, negative symptoms are things that are sort of lacking or taken away from a normal day of living and experiences. And these can include low motivation and also cognitive inhibitions, to name a few. Now the next question, and the main part of my presentation, is how do you treat psychosis? When we look at psychosis, we need to also understand that there are three phases when it comes to treatment. The prodromal phase, which is when not many symptoms are apparent. Acute phase is when there is a lot of psychotic symptoms being apparent. And the recovery phase, which usually takes the longest step, ranging from a few months to a few years. And the main form of current treatment that's been used for a long time are pharmaceutical medications, most particularly antipsychotics. It's the conventional and sought out way to treat psychosis and it specifically alleviates the effects of the positive symptoms that someone has when they have a psychosis. However, there are numerous side effects and they make, them, and they make the individual quite debilitative. These include sedation, nauseating effects, weight changes, and even movement effects. However, there are other forms of treatment, and these mostly in incorporate behavioral therapy or other forms of therapy. However, one, one form of therapy really stood out to me when I was doing my research, and it's called the No Therapy Therapy, and was first performed at the Karapudas Hospital in Finland. 
The way it works is that the objective of the meeting that is set is to create an environment and a social dynamic that allows common ground, lessens hierarchy and jargon, as well as an approach where it's a meeting that isn't really thought as a therapy session. It's a more humanistic approach compared to antipsychotics and allows a person undergoing a psychosis to objectify their feelings and also express them. However, when it comes to treatments, there is one quote that really stood out when I was doing my research. And I quote, if psychosis is biological in origin, meaning the brain changes are biological, how can a psychological therapy be expected to have any effect on it? Although this quotation has a lot of credibility, it's not about only just drugging someone with antipsychotics and hoping for the best or thinking that this is the main form of treatment that will help with psychosis, as a lot of people have to understand and cope as well as bear with how they have to live their everyday life knowing that they had a psychosis and how they can move forward. And this is where philosophy can be incorporated. Today I'll talk about two fields of philosophy, which are phenomenology and heuristic inquiry. Both are qualitative understandings and where there is descriptive analysis gained from experiences. And I believe it's a more humanistic approach that takes account of the deeper thoughts, feelings, and experiences someone goes through when they have a psychosis, and also allows a researcher that sort of lens to, giving, to understanding more about what happens when someone goes through it. When it comes to phenomenology, there are different features that researchers establish, and they have a lot of interviews with different people who are high at risk of psychosis or had undergone a psychosis, and they confirm with these features along with their experiences when they go through the interviews. But I like to focus more on heuristic inquiry. It's a grounded theory that incorporates steps and uh, steps to how a researcher finds their research question. And it was made by Clark Mustakas. The unique part of heuristic inquiry is that there is an incorporation and a focus on value, uh, on valuing personal interests. And it also invites and is aware of the subjectivity when it comes to the process of research. Now, because it's a grounded theory, there's also steps when within heuristic inquiry, which I'll briefly touch. The first one is initial engagement. This is when you find a personally interested subject or a research question, and that's where you start your, your general research. Once you've initially engaged with something, you then immerse with it, and you find yourself looking into the different rabbit holes and the different informations that are found when, during your research. With then, which then leads to an incubation time, which is where your growth and solidifying of information and research takes place. Then after that, you're able to come to a position of illumination. And this is when you find answers for your research question and become more immersed within it. Then now finally, you end up in a position of tacit knowing. And this is when you understand topics of, the, uh, topics of the research question and the subjects that are included in that research question when they're not explicit, explicitly given to you. Now, introducing these research methods, such as heuristic inquiry, I believe it's not only for the researcher of mental health, but it's also something that it can empower a patient and is a tool for them to use in order to have more understanding of what they go through. And it also allows them to objectify how they feel about what they go through. And it's a systematic approach of vocalization and objectifying. And through a subjective incorporation, it makes better sense of their experience and how they can live a life knowing of what they've gone through and what they possibly can go through in the future. To conclude, I hope there is a understanding of what psychosis is, most notably why there is a need to find alternative methods of treatment, or a call to action to find something that's more enriching for both the researcher and the patient, as well as the dynamics between the two. So through an interdisciplinary approach, I created a keystone, which was almost like a case study. And this case study was, on, uh, was about me.
and it draws conclusions that this keystone highlights a need for a more holistic approach when dealing with psychosis. Bringing knowledge in both these fields, it underpins and enriches both a researcher and even a patient, so it works both ways and offers a new approach that should be considered in the future. Thank you for listening. presentation and after that we'll try to uh, replay uh, like Nora her presentation. The third presentation is by, uh, uh, by uh, like, uh, 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 Renato Torres for the love of learning a dissertation on like, educational discontent. My name is Renato. I'm going to talk about the premise and purpose of my Keystone project a creative composition titled The Love of Learning, a dissertation on educational discontent. It's a comedic culmination of my eclectic educational experiences and an expression of my personal philosophy and approach to learning. It describes some of my frustrations with school at individual, interpersonal, and societal scales. It's designed to appeal to students aged 12 to 24 underappreciated teachers, and anyone who has ever wondered when trigonometry or world history is actually going to be useful in daily life. Though it is comedic, I assure you it's quite serious, as I see no reason it can't be both. Education may be no laughing matter, but that's not going to keep me from pregnant jokes. As amateur humans, the task of getting up to speed with the current predicaments we face as a species should be taken as seriously as any emergency. But not so seriously that we forget what a privilege it is to stand on the shoulders of over 100 billion people who have come before us. And what a wild ride it's been so far. I mean, what could possibly be more interesting than the story of our collective quest for understanding of the awesome universe around us? from the inner workings of our minds to cultures and histories of conflict and cooperation, from molecular physics to structural engineering and energy harvesting, from writing to painting and performing. I believe that every discipline contributes to the advancement of our collective knowledge, either directly or indirectly. And in the grand scheme of things, I can hardly imagine anything more important than ensuring the artists, inventors, and voters of tomorrow get the education that they deserve today. It's commonly said that education is priceless. Yet the return on investment is still measured on a, in a dollar value over a single lifetime, rather than by the contributions to collective quality of life and creative ability made possible by the sharing of knowledge. Education might be philosophically priceless, but teacher training, school supplies, and student engagement are all far from cheap. That not only makes sense, it makes lots of dollars for publishers and private schools. Politically speaking, education is priceless only in Europe. Questions about the meaning of education caught my attention from an early age. It may seem obvious, but the purpose of education is to teach young people the skills and knowledge they will need to survive in society and be contributing members of any community, and maybe to give their parents a few hours of peace and quiet. But how do we determine what skills and knowledge are actually helpful? Which communities do we prioritize, local or corporate? And what about the flourishing of students as people? I was asking questions like this that led me to search for a different kind of university. Beyond the magic of the mountains and the happy hippie campus life, Quest Maverick curriculum is the main reason that I came here. And I'm glad I did. Before I came to Quest, I knew that my academic question would have something to do with learning. But I wasn't sure what form it might take or what discipline it might follow. Maybe a psychological study, or a philosophical paper, or a historical literature paper. 
Definitely not common. But it makes sense in retrospect, because I've rarely been one to color inside the lines academically. That made grade school a bit of a slog for me. But when I look around any classroom, I knew I wasn't alone in that experience. School can be a lot of things. It can be challenging, it can be boring, and sometimes it can even be downright unpleasant. But it can also be exciting, enthralling, and even fun. Everyone experiences school through the lens of their own perspective, and more recently, through their own screen. Even before the pandemic, there were plenty of problems to solve in school beyond math homework. The World Bank's 2018 World Development Report, subtitled Learning to Realize Education's Promise, outlines these problems in detail. Two of its main messages are that schooling is not the same as learning, and that schooling without learning is not only a wasted opportunity, it's a great injustice. Beyond the poor learning outcomes and their immediate causes, there are deep systemic causes which call for a paradigm shift in education. With two-thirds of U.S. graduates going into careers completely unrelated to their field of study, and a third of graduates going into careers that don't even require academic degrees, these concerns are well-founded. Many students worry about graduating with the skills and knowledge necessary to compete in the job market and question the idea that their major will lead to a good job. Students' concerns are reflected in employers' complaints about graduate-level skill gaps, and students worry about real-world applicability of what they learn in school. Considering complaints of inadequate pay and organizational support, teacher shortages are unsurprising. Alone, each of these factors are cause for concern. Combined, they represent a cultural crisis that has been brewing for decades, if not centuries. Sir Ken Robinson, an international advisor on education and the arts, once said that schools are an antiquated relic from the industrial age. If he was a knight, anger and sadness are understandable responses to scholastic distress. But a bit of humor can not only lighten the mood and keep things interesting, it can humanize what we're learning. That's why I chose to do comedy for my Keystone Project. Comedy, though often dismissed as mere entertainment, can be much more. Humor can serve as social critique. Laughter can represent resistance. It can even cultivate catharsis in troubled times. From ancient Greek cynics, to medieval jesters and Elizabethan playwrights, to stand-up comedians and late-night talk show hosts, comedy can confound power and insist on the irreducibility of humanity. In my experience, truly critical analysis doesn't come from people that are more invested in the status quo than in changing the world inch by inch or kilometer by kilometer. It often comes from disappointed idealists who refuse to say, that's just the way things are. Not much else. Comedians and academics share the ability to illuminate incongruities between belief and observable reality. That said, my aim in writing and performing this material is to encourage students, teachers, and parents to remember that they're not alone in their struggles, and that the pursuit of knowledge is worthwhile, even if it doesn't always feel that way. I've included a handful of jokes from my project in this presentation, and so far I've talked about the premise and purpose of my Houston projects. But rather than talk about the rest of my material and risk diluting the experience, I'll let my project stand on its own. Though this project is written with the Quest University audience in mind, 
It's also designed to appeal to anyone who's felt uncomfortable in this tiny combination of desk chairs. I'll be performing at open mic nights around Orlando, Florida, throughout the rest of the night in May. So, if you know anyone in the area who likes comedy and critical analysis, I deeply appreciate their attendance. Though I said I'll let my project stand on its own, I'll leave you with the conclusion. Learning is a superpower that anyone can learn, but not everyone will learn it in school. And teaching is more than a job. It's a civic responsibility and an art, but not everyone will do it in school. I'd like to acknowledge that I've lived and learned on the unceded territories of First Nations of the continents now known as the Americas for most of my life. And I'd like to thank every teacher and classmate that has put up with my nonsense and contributed to my development as a human being. With special thanks to my first teacher, my mother. Thank you. presentation back up, this time in the full version. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Nora and today I wanted to share influence on proportion forms are made by mixing sand and clay it are made well sand mold well sand molds or forms are made by mixing sand and clay and pouring the mixture in the pattern and waiting for it to set after that the molds are taken from the patterns the wooden frames the forms are dyed and then prepared for the metal. Here we can see the furnace with metal and alloying elements. It heats up to the point that the metal will melt. Alloying elements are used to bring certain properties to the metal. While the metal is melting in the furnace, another stage is happening as well. Sand molds or forms are made by mixing sand and clay and pouring the mixture in the pattern and waiting for it to set. After that, the molds are taken from the patterns, the wooden frames, the forms are dyed and then prepared for the metal. Now we can go back to the furnace. When the metal is ready, the furnace pours it into ladles. Note that the temperatures are quite high, but it has to be a certain range so that the final product turns out to be fine. The melt also has to be cleaned before pouring to the forms, otherwise it can spoil the result. The ladle is later on moved towards the sand forms. You can see in the videos that they are stacked the liquid iron is poured into the forms and is left to solidify and cool off. This is the part where the first two steps that I showed before come together. Liquid metal and sand forms are connected. When the metal is solidified, the final product is almost ready. However, it is not the final result. The next stage is grind and polish. The workers get rid of the excess metal and polish the product to ensure that it looks good for use. This is the final stage in production where a lot of defects are noticed and the products are sorted whether to be shipped or become scrap metal that can later on be used in the melts. From the videos we saw, we can look at four stages of production line that I used in my analysis, molding, melting, pouring, and polish. Let's just talk about how the order process can go. 
So the way it would be nice to think about this is, let's say we get an order of a blue rectangle, red ellipse, and the yellow triangle. We want this order to be passed on to the production process. We want to make sure that there are enough molds for all products, square, ellipse, and triangle, and also that there is enough metal. Moreover, we want to make sure that all metal is poured into correct forms so that there is not extra spills or no lack of metal parts. Then we polish all products on the order and then we ship. Easy, trackable, we know at which stage was what. But when we are looking at the production process of the foundry, it is important to consider that the process is not linear. Remember those weird graphs I showed before in the video? So let's consider an order of multiple products. Four squares, two ellipses, and four triangles. Let's also say that all the molds for the orders are made in one place, but things can get interesting. For the pour, let's say we decide that there is still enough time and do not pour metal in all molds, but set them apart. Because we have three stars that need to be shipped urgently, but they have just been lying for a while and waiting for their time, so we decide to add them to the pour batch. Now, the new batch with stars is going to the next stage, but the ones that we put aside are still waiting for their turn. When we are done, we know that the star order is full and can be shipped. We leave a square, a triangle, and an ellipse in stock to wait for the rest of the things from original order to be done, and we start another melt. Well, the second melt is done, and in the end, we have two triangles that came out defective. So which ones were they? From which melt? Were they from both? How can we figure out when the defects occurred and what exactly caused them to be defected? The answer to this problem is tracking production. Let's say we have three products and each one of them has a unique number, so we can see where in production it takes place. If the defected product has a unique number 1.1, then we can follow it back to production line and see that it was in the first melt. Then we can see the properties of the melt and check whether this can work. The problem that I came across in my case study is that the foundry doesn't track most of the products. For some products, the tracking number is embedded, but it is very rare and the information is not collected. However, the solution to this problem was to show the potential of applying data analysis in the foundry, so we don't need to use real data for that. To not waste too much time, I wanted to focus on a very small part of production. However, the principle is very similar to other parts too. To do this project, the first step was to simulate data as real-life data is not available at the moment. Second step is to run an analysis model using R. Third part is the visualization of the model and seeing what insights can be brought. Lastly, we can use R to predict the outcome based on a particular variable. This slide shows the steps that were done to simulate a data set. Traceability is an important factor, so each product has to have a unique number. Then, we set up the range for the variable, and based on that, we set up probabilities in the next step. Based on these probabilities, we assign a label to each product, whether it is defected or not. Now we can visualize the data set that we want in the end. The first column has an ID number. The second column has the number for the variable in this batch. The third column has a label. In our case, it will be 1 for defect and 0 for non-defect. This slide shows some code, but I will not go too deep into that. As the production is done in batches, we can base our unique ID off that. There are 50 batches, and each batch has 10 pieces. In the second step, we just repeat batch number for each piece. So if it's 10 pieces, we repeat that 10 times. And finally, we write the number of a batch, a dot, and follow it by a number of a piece. So this is what we get in the end. To assign the value to a factor, we first need to set up the range. So in this case, 30 will be a good range and the higher it goes to 40, it will be worse. And then we need to repeat it for all the pieces in the batch again. So in our case, the send number is the same for all pieces within one batch. And it varies across the set, across the batches. Now we can assign probabilities to our number. So first we can set up the formula. So we want the lowest range to be the lowest probability. And this is the formula on the screen. By calculating the range and the actual number from the data set before 
and the lower range, we can plug those values into the formula and get the probability of defect to be 61% when the send is actually 36.12. Now that we know the probability, we can use R to assign a number for each piece. As you remember, one is for defected and zero is for a good one. And uh, the R binom function in R does this all when you input the probability as well. So in the end, this is how our data set would look like. We'll keep in mind that there is probably 496 more rows, at least in how we specified it, but you get the idea. In R, I use the generalized linear model because it's great for dealing with binomial outcomes. So we have defected or not defected. And this is a graph for the data that I input. As you remember, I mentioned that the lowest send range gives us less defects and higher send range gives us more defects. And if you look at the line of the graph, you can see that the probabilities are increasing as the send quantity goes to the higher range. Now we can use R to check what's the probability of defect when send is 36.12. And as you can see in the outcome, it's 0.61 or 61%. And now we can check it with a formula that we used before, and it's also 61%, which is what we wanted. So this is pretty much what I did. I did it for several stages, and I did it for sometimes multiple factors, but this gives the gist of it. So for my final thoughts, I wanted to say that data in real life is definitely less structured than what we want to think, or maybe what I would want to think. And I came across inability to gather data at the foundry and a whole bunch of other problems. However, I believe it is still possible to come up with solutions for the problems that arise. For example, I decided to simulate the data set and propose it to the foundry as a way of tracking maybe their full production or at least part of their production that is more important for defect detection. So this is pretty much it. Thank you for your time and feel free to ask any questions. I'm, I'm very glad that we managed to get the whole video playing, not only because of the R code, which is beautiful. Um, next thing. Hello. Excellent. The cameras are working. Sam, if you have a working camera, it would be amazing. If not, oh, you see the back of my head. Um, Hello. <laughs> Can you right, see so, me? So um, how we're going uh, to like proceed with this is um, we're going to have some uh, questions um, from the audience. Hopefully, you can hear them. If not, I would like repeat them, and then you may uh, proceed to provide uh, an answer. I'd love to give the microphone to the audience. Let's see if we can do it without using a microphone. Any any questions, if you can say for who and then post your question. That would be amazing. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Renato about uh, education and his education experience. Um, was coming to Flex your first time experiencing alternative learning styles, or had you like what's, I guess, what school system were you previously raised in or maybe five couple? Thank you. Um, good to be heard. Like Renato, this is a question for you. Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that, by the way. Um, I was, so I was homeschooled until age 13, and then I did, um, I did online K-12. I did sort of, um, so it was a program called Leaves of Learning where a bunch of renegade teachers uh, who didn't like teaching in public school uh, rented out a big barn basement 
um, much nicer than it sounds. And that was a sort of adjunct alternative school. And then we also did a um, sort of homeschool program where all of, the, all of our parents in this big homeschool group we had um, taught whatever they were proficient in, from cooking to forensic science to construction engineering. And um, yeah, those are my main alternative education experiences. Very much. More questions. Interesting. Uh, I have a question for Nora. Uh, very early in your presentation, you mentioned how you wanted to uh, originally look at the social sciences, but you moved more towards uh, boundary level stuff. I was wondering if you had an interdisciplinary finding, I guess, or like any good reason to like make this switch, or if you saw really good, like big similarities between like social stuff and country stuff, or if you saw a lot of differences, and if so, what made you choose the country over social sciences? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I don't think there was a particular reason for me to switch. I didn't see any differences, but I did think one to be not the best. Uh, that's what we do for social studies, and that's higher like, but then, um, going from my experience where I found to be a high department to see what I can apply from question to my work experience, that's pretty much it. I hope that. Thank you very much. I just want to check if the sound level is good enough. Me being at the back, I um, um, I kind of struggle. Is it is it is it is it loud enough? Okay, excellent. It's loud enough. More questions. Yeah. Um, question for Nora. Um, really like your model, by the way. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, there are any um, uh, limitations to it. Um, did you explore any limitations, any strengths, something like that? Nora, uh, any like limitations and strengths uh, to your model? <coughs> oh, <laughs> uh, I guess my biggest limitation is that it's not really applied at this point. Um, I, as I mentioned, that there is definitely a lack of data available uh, at the, in the industry that I'm working at, and um, collecting it is quite hard, and there is a lot of, there is a lack of desire to collect it properly from people who work there, so that would be the limitation. And for the strengths, I'm not really sure. Uh, for me, my biggest strength was that I showed how it could be applied and what could be worked. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you asked about. Good enough, thank you. <laughs> All right, we had, yeah. Um, I have a question for Renato about um, the, can you go into a little bit more detail about the content of your stand-up? What are you like? Because you said you're doing a comedy act. What's the the content that you kind of cover in that comedy act? Is it about education, or are you educating through comedy about students? Could you repeat the question, Todd? Um, the content of your uh, of your like stand up. Can you maybe comment on um, the content of your stand up? Oh, um, it covers a broad range, but. To answer your question as best I can, um, it, the main content is about um, rhetorical and practical incongruities that we encounter in the educational experience. Um, one example might be, hey, you're going to use this later in life. This is going to be useful information. And then going on to never use it again, um, even if it's a useful learning practice. Uh, the incongruity between the rhetoric and practicality of what we learn in the setting. Thank you very much. I saw a question by like Tanji. I have a question for Sam. Yep. Uh, so you talked about the um, integration of philosophy as part of this uh, therapeutic model for psychosis, and I'm just wondering if you can speak to um, how receptive the field of clinical psychology or counseling has been to more 
Sir, could you repeat the question? Um, the question is um, how like, receptive um, the field is for more, uh, for more sort of like philosophical and um, um, like approaches. Uh, through my research, I haven't really um, read much about how receptive uh, psychological uh, practices would incorporate philosophy, but there is uh, research papers that look into, you know, a, a certain aspect of phenomenology, like neurophenomenology. So that's one, uh, that's probably one uh, possible answer is they look at how, um, you know, through neuropsychology, how the sort of outputs are and what is present behavior wise can be um, explained through uh, philosophy so i would say that there is somewhat some sort of uh, uh they're receptive to uh, uh philosophy based approaches thank you very much we have time for one more question yeah. um i have a question for sam and it is yeah. if you had this quote in your presentation about uh biological whether uh, non-biological interventions would be uh, still valuable. Is that a widespread uh, perspective in the field, or is it more of just one of the one of various perspectives? Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't really hear the whole question. Um, uh, the question was uh, like regarding a, uh, a quote, and I hope I like, remember this correctly, about the biological origin of like, psychosis and the non-biological like, treatments, uh, if that is a widely um, used view in the field? Well, the use of antipsychotics and this being the uh, sort of normal trend for how to treat it, it's very based off uh, biological uh, processes that happen within the brain. So there are more fo there's more focus generally when it comes to the biological aspect or how do you change or how do you balance the, um, the brain and the brain sort of activity. Uh, and there isn't too much on um, <clears throat> approaches that are non like non biological in origin, but uh, that's one thing that I've been trying to uh, sort of uh, address and think that it's necessary and appropriate because everything isn't sort of biological. There is a whole aspect of you know, you know human feelings and thoughts. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our three speakers for all over the world for some like fantastic presentations um, and like keystone thank you very much excellent um shall we get the, uh, more students in and move over to the next presenter i think that's andrew is that you i set the bar low for you so I needed two extra people to I'm make this happen.
Yep. Thank you very much, everybody, and welcome back for session two of this morning's Keystone Symposium. I would like to welcome our next speaker, who, when asked whether I would be their mentor, and then hearing what they wanted to study, I thought, was I just manipulated? <laughs> Anyways, let's welcome Jill Swart. Hi, everybody. All right, well, hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, firstly, I would love to congratulate you for making it this long. Well done. <laughs> and secondly, my name is Jill. Um, I'm here today to present to you, well, my life's work, uh, but before I begin, I'd love to just take a moment, um, take a moment to smile. You see, I smile because I'm so grateful to be here today speaking to all of you about my education, my passions, and most notably the book that I've written titled The Constitution of Manipulation. The Constitution for me not only acts as a reflection of four years of academic achievement and hard work, but also as a reflection of my curiosity and my personal passions. You see, I grew up in a family of four. My father, Paul, my mother, Julia, my brother, Alex, and me, the youngest child. And as much as I would love to stand up here and argue to all of you that I was the most impressive child or the most interesting, Unfortunately for me, that was never the case. I was a bit of a black sheep in my family, but not for the reasons that you might anticipate. You see, I wasn't the textbook loner with weird hobbies. I just wasn't them. Ever since I could remember, my parents and my brother have always been very likable and charismatic people. They were always able to present themselves and communicate their ideas in a way that others around them were naturally drawn to them, including me. And because of this, they all have extremely extensive and meaningful social networks. And, you know, sometimes I like to think that I am fairly similar to my family members in a number of ways. However, being this extremely likable and charismatic individual was, unfortunately for me, not one of them. Throughout my life, my family members have emotionally moved and inspired me simply through the ways in which they spoke to others around them, the way in which they presented themselves. And it was through watching these interactions with colleagues, clients, other members of the family that truly inspired my interest in psychology, charisma, 
human behavior, manipulation, well, the list goes on. These interests, you see, they soon manifested into a personal fascination for me, a fascination that proved to be both motivational and kind of toxic in regards to my daily life. You see, I care a lot about what other people think of me, friends, bosses, teachers, clients, and yes, even strangers. And this, who could blame me? I grew up in a family with, surrounded by extremely likable and charismatic people, and for years I tried. Oh man, I tried to become as close to as charismatic as they were, but again, it just never really worked out for me. And this is what led me to believe that charisma was a trait that was natural. It was something that you were either born with or you weren't. And as somebody who was not naturally charismatic, I always wondered, is it possible to fabricate charisma? Or even better, and hear me out, is it possible to use science to fabricate the most compelling charisma you've ever witnessed? <laughs> and after these four years of pondering, studying research and the writing of my book, I've come to the conclusion that yes, yes you can. And that, my friends, is what I have explained, proven, and very carefully laid out in my book, The Constitution of Manipulation. Picture this. Imagine being able to get what you want all of the time. Although it's a really selfishly loaded question, one could argue that the prospect of getting what you want and achieving your goals all of the time would be pretty freaking great. But who even does that? Who gets what they want all of the time? Charismatic people, persuasive people, people who are well-liked, people like my mom, my dad, my brother, who get what they want through their compelling character. And although I had never fit into one of these categories before, I'm happy to know this now, because it's through the research that I've done and the experiments that I've conducted and the writing of this book that I have educated myself to be the person that you see on stage today. And let me give you an example. Through some of the strategies that I've learned through writing this book, I knew that if I started this presentation off with a joke about myself, something to wake you up, something to make you laugh, this would cause your interest in who I am as an individual to spike, making you want to know more about me. Which is why after that, I told you, I gave you some insight into my life growing up, who I am, my values, my family. And I did so in a way that showed an element of personal vulnerability. And I knew that by doing that, that would cause you to feel a sense of trust and familiarity into who I am as a daughter, as a sister, and as a person, not just as a student. And I also know that these examples that I'm giving you right now of manipulative strategies and social strategies that I've already implemented into this presentation are either piquing your interest into what's really in my constitution or that you're sitting here listening to me and thinking to yourself, am I being manipulated right now? And the answer is, well, yeah. It's through my research and the writing of my constitution that I have taught myself how to speak in the way in which I'm speaking to you right now. How to conduct my body language in a situation like this. How to manipulate me and how I present myself in order to manipulate you and what you think of me. So if you're an individual like me, who seeks to understand the psychology and the science behind being liked, being accepted and being trusted by others, my constitution is for you. If you're interested in social psychology, interpersonal rhetoric, behavioral science, neuroscience, linguistics, my constitution's for you. If you're interested in how other people make decisions, judgments, or social conclusions, my constitution is for you. Because ideally, with the knowledge of how others make social conclusions about you, and the ability to control your own presentation, how you speak, how you behave, you can cater how you present yourself to the liking of others around you. And that, my friends, is a clear example of manipulation. And I know, I understand that when you hear the word manipulation, you're probably thinking, oh wow, Jill, that's, that's pretty evil. 
That's pretty dark. But I'm here today to assure you that it's not. Manipulation has just culturally received a bad rap. And with my constitution, I sought to change the reputation of manipulation as both a term and a practice. Manipulation, defined by the Cambridge Dictionary, is to control something or someone to your advantage, often unfairly or dishonestly. So if we were to just scratch out that last part, <laughs> This would serve as a near perfect definition of the practice that I am both studying and supporting. However, for the sake of clarity and uniqueness, for my constitution, I wrote a new definition of manipulation. The practice of purposefully altering or controlling the perceptions of others using a social skill set rooted in behavioral and psychological knowledge. And yes, I know, this one has a lot more words, but at least it's all encompassing. And let me explain. I would love for you to raise your hand if you have ever changed little bits about your personality, the way you spoke, the way you dressed, the way you acted around somebody who you were trying to impress or when you were meeting somebody new. <laughs> Great, <laughs> me too. And it wasn't until I started learning about manipulation, what it was and its practice, that I realized that when I was doing that, purposefully controlling the way in which I came across to another individual with a particular social goal or advantage in mind that I was manipulating that person. And again, that social goal or social advantage can be anything. Whether it be to impress an employer during a job interview, seem likable to new friends, or seem way more intelligent than you actually are in a quest classroom. Guilty. <laughs> You see, I catered elements of myself to the individuals around me. And this is what helped me succeed. This helped me achieve my social goals. I used manipulation to get what I wanted all of the time. And since then, it's been working out pretty great for me. So even if you think that you're the most charismatic person in the world, you're the most persuasive, everybody likes you and listens to what you have to say and agrees with what you have to say, Read this constitution anyway. Read it because you're curious. Read it because you want to better understand others. Read it because you want to be able to tell when others are manipulating you. Persuasive or not, charismatic or not, this constitution will provide you with the ability to control your behaviors, your actions, your speech in a way that will allow you to control how you're perceived. And in today's culture, how you're perceived by others is the one and only key into determining your future and success as an individual. Thank you. And most specifically, thank you to the individuals I've listed behind me. Questions for Jill? I'll yeah. let you. Yeah, uh, Gerhardt, then okay. Oscar. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I've noticed in this speech you've not only constructed an image of what this book is, but you've constructed an image of a potential audience, therefore. Mm -hmm. It was definitely not an intended effect of this book, but I think it's an absolutely fantastic suggestion as another additional possible audience for this book. And I think that that's extremely clever and really smart to look into as well. But thank you for the idea, Gerhardt. That's fantastic. Thank you. Oscar, yeah. I, I feel like a lot of the charisma is practical rather than theoretical. Um, how do you feel like, like how much of uh, being able to manipulate people, do you think is uh, your practical experience with talking to people and your uh, what, what natural charisma versus what you can study in a book? Like if I read this and just studied this manuscript without actually having the practical experience of trying to manipulate people, do you think I'd be able to? 
would simply because that's how I did it. I think it's really interesting because I have practiced this speech in front of a couple of people and they said, you know, Jill, that, that's so weird that you say that you weren't this super charismatic person, you weren't this person who could, you know, kind of just get up and speak and things like that. And it was through the research that I did and the learning of these strategies and reading and writing my book that I was able to manipulate me and how I present myself in order to kind of come off as this charismatic person. So I definitely think that there is an element of social practice and natural charisma that is 100% helpful, like I'll tell you that, definitely helpful and useful to have. However, if you are starting at say an a, a level of absolute zero, this book is still will still help you get there and still help you manage to appear more charismatic. I'm not saying it'll make you more charismatic, but it'll make you look more charismatic or make you seem more charismatic. And that's all that matters, right? <laughs> Um, Tangine, yeah. You alluded to experiments. Have yes. You, have you done experiments in your book? Can you give an example of the kind of experiments you did? So I did just kind of mundane social experiments. For my EL, I had two separate jobs that I was doing um, simultaneously, like uh, during the same summer. And in one of them, I was trying to use so there's something that I did study called a mirroring method, which is how much you can make your actions and your speech alike to the individual in which you're speaking to. And with both bosses at both jobs, I took one above, so it was plus one, and then I took one minus one, where I seemed very authoritative and very confident in myself and my abilities, and then also on the second job, very subordinate, very I'll do whatever you say, don't worry about me. Um, and I studied the different effects of both of those and having both of those outlooks and both of those presentations of myself. Um, and with the one in which I came across as much more authoritative and confident and kind of plus one, if you will, um, I actually received a promotion in the first eight days I worked there. So. Those are some of the experiments that I've done. Um, as much as I would love to say they were extremely formal and scientific, they were not, but they were things that I was able to kind of write down what my findings were personally. Um, so I was able to include my own personal experiences in the book as well. Yeah, Anna. Um, do you think that there's a difference between charisma and I do think there's a difference, but I don't think it's that big, to be honest with you. I think that how, I think that somebody can be extremely confident, but not come across as necessarily very persuasive. Um, it's kind of, I would say, excuse my language, but like, you think of like a cocky douchebag, they're not very persuasive, right? <laughs> they're not very persuasive people, but they're, and they wouldn't consider them necessarily very charismatic people. However, their confidence shoots through the roof, right? So I do think that there is definitely a difference um, between confidence and charisma, but I don't think it's that polar opposite, if that makes sense. I definitely think to be charismatic, you need to have an element of confidence, but I don't think to be confident, you need an element of charisma. All right. Yeah. Let's thank Jill once again. Thank, thank you. you. Excuse my language, I apologize. <laughs>